All right, now we're going to look at factors affecting heat transfer. And it's going to be looking at those three equations, essentially, as well. And there, uh, there's five knowledge requirements on this page alone. So we need to understand the relationship between flow rates in the heat exchanger and temperature. And that's going to be a little tricky because it's not necessarily intuitive. Then we're going to look at the effects of heat exchanger flow rates that are too high or too low and see what some problems can be. Um, how do we actually control temperature in the heat exchanger? Um, what are the effects of fouling in the heat exchanger and or scaling? So right up here on the left, it gives us that equation that is often misused. But you'll see that if we were to put that up here, the rate of heat transfer in a heat exchanger is equal to, well, it's heat transfer coefficient times area times the differential temperature. There's no mass flow rate in this equation, right? So you're going to have to you have to figure out what this U is here, but U is the heat transfer coefficient is determined by the type of material we use. Do you use copper, or are we using um, uh, titanium, or we're just using regular old steel? I mean, they all have different heat transfer coefficients, and they all have different thicknesses. So we'll be looking at that in detail. We'll see that the heat transfer coefficient, if it if it is a really good heat transfer, er. Well, funny word there, but it'll have a high heat transfer coefficient, which means I can transfer more heat with a higher coefficient. Titanium has a higher coefficient than copper. Um, you know, so I would probably, if I could afford it, put titanium tubes in my condenser if I could. And then you can also, if I have more surface area, I can transfer more heat. If I have a greater differential temperature between the hot and the cold fluid, I could transfer more heat. Nothing about flow rate in this equation. So some things to look at. What if I was to start reducing the heat transfer coefficient? Well, that would occur if, say, I started getting scale buildup or I'm fouling the heat exchanger. I am no longer have the, the heat transfer coefficient I had. So if I wanted to get the same heat transfer, well, I can't change the area of the tubes unless they're plugged or unplugged during an outage. So I would have to have a greater differential temperature to actually get the same heat transfer. So we'll be using this a lot. Um, and if I said, you know, heat transfer initial, uh, let's say I was going into an outage and I had some tube leaks in my condenser. And at, at the end of the outage, I wanted the same heat transfer rate that I had. So the heat transfer rate initial would be equal to final. And if I said, well, I still have the same tubes and initially I had this area and a differential temperature, but now I still have the same tube, but let's say I plugged 10% of my tubes. Well, now I only have 0.9, 90% of the area that I had. So you can see what's going to happen. To get the same heat transfer, I would have to drive up the differential temperature because this area went down by 10%. So we'll be looking at that a lot as well in, in uh, heat transfer and fluid flow. Kind of introductory in components. So let's look at those other two equations and kind of see what's happening. Now, this is definitely not intuitive. If we look at a heat exchanger, and I'm just going to draw one, simple, and I'm going to have hot oil coming in at the top. So this is hot oil. And I'm going to have cold water coming in here. So this is water and it's cold water, and I know it's going to go through tubes, and it's going to exit as hot water. And hopefully, the oil exits as cold oil. Great, we typically are going to control the temperature here, and, and, and you'll see I'm really trying to control this temperature right here, the outlet temperature of the oil is what I'm trying to, because typically it's going to go to bearings. Bearings. So what I'll do is I'll usually have a valve on the outlet of the heat exchanger that I can throttle to control how much cooling water flow I have through the heat exchanger, and that will adjust this, how much cooling occurs on this oil. Now, here's some things. If I say Q dot of the oil equals... Q dot of the water, what I'm saying is all of the energy transferred out of the oil goes into the water, and the rate at which it does it is the same. So it's not intuitive, but I can then say mass flow rate of the oil 
times the specific heat capacity of the oil times T hot minus T cold of the oil. And so this entire side is oil is going to be equal to well, the mass flow rate of the water, specific heat capacity of the water, T hot minus T cold of the water, the delta T of the water. And this whole side is water. So you see this equal sign. So let's adjust some things. Let me adjust the mass flow rate here. I'm going to increase the mass flow rate of the water. So now water is coming through and it's going really fast. Water is going really fast. So it doesn't have as much time, not contact time, to pick up the energy for each pound mass of oil that's coming through here. The water is going at a higher mass flow rate. So actually the temperature right here, if I was monitoring this temperature on the water side, it's not, each pound mass is not getting as hot. So if I start running the water through it really fast, I've increased the mass flow rate of the water. And look, the cold was here, let's say it was 60 and it was 90. Now it's going fast and actually now it's only 80 because it doesn't pick up as much heat. So the delta T actually goes down. And what happens on the oil side if I do that? Well, I had hot oil and now I'm going to have even colder oil because I'm providing more cooling to it, which is probably what I've wanted. All right, so we need to look. It's not intuitive necessarily. Let's say I increase the flow rate of the oil, kept the mass flow rate of the water constant. Well, if I increase the mass flow rate of the oil and keep the mass flow rate of the water the same, you can see that this is going to be going really fast, not being as in contact with the, the water as much, right? So the mass flow rate went up, but the differential temperature will actually go down. This would be sitting here, say, at 130 degrees, and let's say it was 80 degrees leaving. Well, now it's going to possibly be leaving at 90 degrees, and you can see that delta T went down because we're putting more heat load on that water by putting more mass flow rate to it. So that's important to understand. And if fouling occurs, that's going to inhibit heat transfer. So the cold water will stay cold, and the hot oil will stay hot. Because if you do anything to inhibit heat transfer, either via sca uh, scaling or some sort of tube fouling, we're not going to get as much of the energy transferred from the hot fluid to the cold fluid. That's going to change differential temperatures for the given mass flow rates. More on that, once again, more on that when we talk about uh, heat transfer. We're going to get into this a lot. We'll be solving lots of problems.